Thanks, Miguel. Good afternoon. Let's, let's first start by thinking about the armamentarium we have for our patients with ulcerative colitis. We have a bunch that are currently available. We have a, a few that are coming soon, and then some really exciting next wave options that are coming in the, I would say, uh, not so near, not quite distant future. Of course, you know about the anti-TNFs. We have infliximab, galimumab, and adalimumab. Uh, we are learning soon about high-dose reporting of adalimumab for ulcerative colitis. As you may or may not know, this study uh, hasn't been reported yet, but the perception has been that higher doses of adalimumab might help us early on in those patients with active ulcerative colitis. We have, of course, the anti-leukocyte trafficking drug in vedolizumab. Then coming soon, and we'll talk a little bit more about this probably in March, are the JAK inhibitors, uh, one that will be available soon and others coming on their tail. As far as next wave opportunities that we'll uh, briefly mention, there are the anti-interleukin-1223 drugs. We have ustekinumab being studied for ulcerative colitis. We're probably a year plus away of hearing about any data from that. I'll briefly tell you about our experience with hyperbaric oxygen for inpatients with ulcerative colitis. We'll talk about the sphingosine-1 phosphate receptor modulators, uh, their new anti-leukocyte trafficking drugs, and then phosphodiesterase-4 inhibitors. The ones with asterisks are small molecules. They're not biologics. I'm not sure if we should be referring to them as immunomodulators. For now, I think as a crew, we're referring to them as small molecules, which are, of which the group tofacitinib is one of them that we'll talk a little bit more extensively today. So let's think about positioning. That's what this is about, is when do we use and how do we use the biologics that we currently have. Certainly after failure of optimized 5-ASA or immunomodulators, notice that it says or, not and, that it's a perfectly reasonable time after failing optimized 5-ASAs to move on to biologic therapy, not having to go through immunomodulators regardless of what your payers might say. Certainly those who are failing to taper off of steroids and, and clearly those with moderate to severely active disease. When we think about our first-line biologics, the ones that we currently have available are the anti-TNFs. What we have going for them is the rapidity of onset, particularly the IV formulations. You've all heard and talked to those patients who feel better on their way home from an infusion of infliximab. But clearly what we deal with the anti-TNFs is immunogenicity and loss of response over time, which brings up the question about using them as mono or combination therapy. Vedalizumab, which is a very safe drug, and we are very co comfortable and confident in its safety profile, not just in the phase three studies, but now with extensive global experience. Yet the trade-off there is it probably does work slower. We do see patients who have a very rapid response to vedalizumab, but in general, they're slower than the anti-TNFs, and sometimes we need a bridge to get us through there, whether it's corticosteroids or other. Another time to use biologics, particularly vedolizumab, of course, are after a failure of a first biologic, so using it as your second biologic. And at that point, I'm always talking to a surgeon as well. After somebody fails biologic therapy, which is first line, particularly an anti-TNF, I'm not sending my patients to surgery, but I'm having my patients talk to their surgeons or our surgeons so they know what they're thinking about, they know what's on the horizon, and they understand that the worst time to meet a surgeon is laying in a gurney in the hospital or in the emergency room, meeting a surgeon for the first time, feeling forced into it. And you really need to anticipate these conversations. Your surgeons will never mind speaking with a patient who doesn't need surgery for ulcerative colitis, but you're thinking about that it might be something they need for the future. So let's focus a little bit on tofacitinib. This is the new kid on the block, almost. At least we knew the new kid is moving in soon. The approval is expected in early March of this coming year. So we're very excited to have this drug that will highly likely to be in our armamentarium very soon. As you may know, this inhibits JAK1, JAK2, and JAK3 in vitro, but does have some specificity for JAK1 and JAK3 over JAK2. Interestingly, some of the new JAK inhibitors coming that are currently being studied are more specific. Whether that increases efficacy or decreases adverse event profile is yet to be seen. What we're doing with these drugs is modulating the signaling from an important subset of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are inter interleukins 2, 4, 7, 9, 15, and 21. And we're going to really learn how to use this drug soon. In the clinical trials, 10 milligrams twice daily. Remember, this is an oral drug. 10 milligrams twice daily orally is used for induction. And both doses were studied in remission, both 5 milligrams twice a day and 10, 10, 10 milligrams twice a day over the course of maintenance. Here are the results from the registration trials, which are referred to as Octave. 
you can see that there's a clear statistically significant benefit in uh, remission rates in induction, as you can see on top there, looking at the 10 milligram per milligram dose. And you can see that there's also improvement in mucosal healing with these drugs with, uh, with the 10 milligram per kilogram dose in induction. If you think about long-term exposure and what happens over time with dosing, both the five milligram per, uh, I'm sorry, not per kilogram, five milligram dose and 10 milligram dose both worked and were effective with a slight increased efficacy in the 10 milligram twice daily dose. So again, 10 milligrams, twice daily for induction, and both doses studied, it's unclear what the FDA or how the FDA will approve it, whether it's five milligrams in maintenance or 10 milligrams in maintenance. Why is it relevant? Where the dose, there's a direct relationship between the dose and adverse events, specifically around infections and more specifically around herpes zoster. So in the five milligram dose in maintenance, it was actually a fairly low rate of herpes zoster, but in the 10 milligram twice daily dose in maintenance, it was up to a 5% rate of herpes zoster, which is a real and measurable rate. We're talking about one in 20 patients. This might go away now that we have a way to vaccinate our patients safely with the new killed zoster vaccination that was just approved and will be available to our patients as we're getting this drug going. But something to keep in mind is getting your patients vaccinated isn't always so easy and something that you have to work on and make sure they're getting it at the right timing. So that's really the reason we're thinking more carefully about the five milligram or 10 milligram dose and is that slightly increased efficacy with 10 milligrams worth worth the potential risk that you're offering to your patients. There were some non-melanoma skin cancer seen, although in the RA literature there was some concern about gastrointestinal perforation. It's hard to make sense of it from a pathophysiological standpoint, and the risk was not increased over placebo when, when looking at in, in, the, uh, in the IBD clinical trials. Interestingly, we follow LDL and HDL, and there does seem to be an increase in LDL that you see over time. We check it at baseline when we're using it, then a few months later, then I'll probably check it six months or a year to make sure that the numbers aren't going too high, but not directly related to cardiovascular events. There sometimes can be a serum creatinine kinase increase, and we've seen that in a number of patients in the clinical trials where you watch their CK go up. It seems to plateau and then stay at a not too concerning level, and it hasn't been associated with any adverse events along with it, such as rhabdo or, or, or other uh, adverse events, but something to potentially keep an eye on, although I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do with the information. I suppose if it keeps going up, that might be somebody you want to dose decrease or, pot or potentially consider stopping the drug. There were some rare elevations and liver uh, amino transferases, and it's very unusual to see lymphocytopenia, neutropenia, or, or uh, low hemoglobin. They were reported in the clinical trials, but really didn't seem to be a significant issue, and actually the patients in the clinical trials already came in with low, with low, uh, with leukopenia, which probably was a contributor in those specific patients. Just to put in perspective that zoster and herpes simplex are not just something we think about with tofacitinib, that all of the drugs, all the biologic drugs we use do have an increased risk of zoster. We've all seen this in our patients. We know about this in our patients, but tofacitinib does have a slightly higher incidence rate, and as mentioned, it's a dose-dependent phenomenon that we're seeing at the higher dose over maintenance, not induction. But again, think about the vaccine that we're going to be uh, offering to all of our patients. So where are we going to po position tofacitinib when it becomes available to us in March? Well, it's oral. It has a fast onset. There's some data to suggest that within days this starts working. And in fact, our patients in the clinical trials were telling us that they were feeling better within a few days. This opens some very interesting opportunities, such as could this actually replace prednisone? And historically, while we're waiting for our biologic drugs to get going, we haven't been hesitant to give our patients corticosteroids. But is this an opportunity maybe to use steroid-free treatment for our patients with ulcerative colitis? Is it safe to use in combination? This is something that is completely untested, but there's some compelling interest to maybe use tofacitinib to bridge to another drug that would be a safe biologic agent such as vetalizumab. But again, more to learn about this. And where are we going to position it when we have it available in March? Well, unfortunately, payers are probably going to tell us where we need to position it at first, but they'll likely start it after anti-TNF or vetalizumab failures. But there's no reason we shouldn't be considering this drug at the same point as we're considering starting biologic drugs, whether it be anti-TNFs or vetalizumab. And I think as time goes, we'll be 
you're looking at this on the same level playing field as starting this drug at the same point in time that we would start the biologic agents that we are familiar with. Just a brief comment on some of the next wave drugs that are coming. There's the anti-interleukin-1223. As I mentioned, eustachinumab studies are ongoing. There's some oral anti-leukocyte trafficking drugs. There's a phosphodiesterase-4 inhibitor drug that is very interesting. I'll briefly mention the experience with hyperbaric oxygen, but also show you some results here about ozonamod, which is a sphingosine-1 phosphate receptor modulator, which to me is kind of the next, new, the next drug that we're interested in that's coming very soon. So this is the, uh, these are the data from ozonamod and ulcerative colitis. These are just looking at one snapshot from the clinical trial, which is the percent of patients with mucosal healing at week eight. And you can see a very clear and I think very compelling and exciting signal here looking at mucosal healing just at week eight with this oral drug compared to placebo at 12%. You can see the others up to 30% and 34%. And then very briefly, just telling you that this is maybe looking into the future, a study that both Miguel Roguero's site at Pittsburgh and us at Dartmouth were part of, including the Mayo Clinic, is looking at the use of hyperbaric oxygen for inpatients, sick inpatients with ulcerative colitis. And you can see that in this very small trial of just 18 patients, so I don't want to get too excited about this, but if you look at the results here, you can see that day 5 and day 10 clinical remission rates of 50% in the treatment group with an active sham control. Patients went into the chamber and felt that they were getting pressurized a little bit but not brought to the pressure that's required for treatment effect had 0% clinical remission, and you could see even endoscopic remission rates at day 10 where they're showing a signal. So more to learn on this, but something that could be very exciting because of the great safety profile of using this. So next frontier is for positioning drugs for UC. We have the biologics versus the small molecules as first line, we're learning to understand how disease burden impacts the choice of therapy, meaning people who are coming in who are having a protein losing colopathy and losing a lot of their anti-TNF drug in their stool as opposed to their serum, are these small molecules going to be an answer to that to help us? We need to learn how to combine drug classes. We need to learn if there's any role of on-demand use of small molecules because of the lack of immunogenicity but again, something that we need to think about carefully, and do we have an opportunity for completely prednisone-free ulcerative colitis treatment? So thank you, Miguel.